Hello and welcome to the Rook intro and Ceph deep dive. My name is Blaine. I'll be joined today by my colleague Satoru. Uh, also keep your eyes open for presentations by other Rook maintainers, Travis and Sebastian. Uh, I wanna start with the goals of our talk today, uh, starting with a background on Kubernetes' storage challenges, uh, talking about what is Rook. Uh, what the background is of Rook with Ceph, uh, and then also talking about the key features of Rook and Ceph. We also uh, released Rook 1.7 recently. I'll be talking about some of the new features there. Satoru will give you a demo, and then we'll conclude with the uh, Q&A. Starting with uh, background, what are the challenges that Rook hopes to solve? In Kubernetes, we have a platform that is used to manage distributed applications. These are ideally stateless, but in practice, this is pretty rare. Something requires storage, something somewhere. If we rely on external storage, this is not portable. Often deployment can be a burden. And for day two operations, we need someone to manage it. Um, it may therefore make sense to go to a cloud provider managed service, but then we may be uh, faced with vendor lock-in. Rook aims to help solve these issues, uh, but, but, but what, what is Rook? Like how does it help solve these issues? Uh, Rook makes storage available inside of your Kubernetes cluster. This storage you can consume like any other Kubernetes storage. You make a storage class for it and then users can create persistent volume claims to get uh, access to that storage for their applications. Rook is an operator. Uh, it has many operators available, but generally there'll be one operator running at a time, and then custom resource definitions to define that storage and set parameters for it. Uh, Rook provides automated management, including deployment, configuration and upgrades of the storage, and it is fully open source. And it's available to, uh, to anyone who wants it. Rook has three live storage providers right now, three active storage providers, I should say. Uh, for stable, we have Ceph, thus the upcoming deep dive into Rook with Ceph. We also have NFS and Cassandra in alpha phase. And with some recent changes, we're now able to release all of these storage providers independently, so they don't all have to be released at the same time. If some features still need to be baked a little bit for NFS, there, there's that time and freedom available uh, as an example. Also, some exciting news. It is Rook's fifth birthday coming up. Uh, Rook in November of 2016 at KubeCon Seattle went public with version 0 0.1. And in that five years, we've had 110 more releases. Uh, so much of this is due to community support, feedback, and pull requests. And we really just can't, can't thank everyone enough who's uh, come in and, and con contributed to the project. Digging into some background of like now getting into the, the Ceph deep dive, uh, I want to cover what, what is Ceph uh, and what are the architectural layers of Rook? How does it work with Ceph? Well, Ceph is our cephalopod themed storage service. And there are a lot of words on this slide, but the TLDR is that Ceph keeps your data safe through scale. Uh, it provides the three most common storage types that you might want, and that's block, uh, shared file system, as well as S3 compliant object storage. With the architectural layers, we have Rook, Ceph CSI, and Ceph. Uh, starting with the Rook layer, that owns the deployment and management of everything else, which is Ceph and Ceph CSI. Uh, Ceph CSI itself is the thing that dynamically provisions storage in Ceph and then mounts that into user application pods. And with Ceph, we have our data layer that does all the data protection, data movement. It is really the 
most of the brains of the operation. I don't want to talk about this slide too deeply. Uh, the real takeaway here is that Rook is really just this operator that you see at the top in the middle in blue. Uh, all of the stuff in red is Ceph, and there are a lot of a lot of components of Ceph running at any given time. Even Ceph CSI, which is a lot more simple, still has a lot of components running at once. And these are what you see in green here. Rook also has some helper demons of its own, uh, which may be Rook discovery as presented here. Uh, and the Rook operator also manages deployment of those. Um, and again, Rook manages all of this. Really, the Rook operator is the only thing that the user needs to create. With CSI, this is the driver that actually makes the storage inside Ceph, like that it, it creates it inside Ceph, and then it connects that storage into user application pods. I also won't go too deep into everything you see here. I think the important uh, takeaway, uh, sort of expanding beyond the CSI view from before a little bit, um, the takeaway is that neither Rook nor Ceph CSI are in the data path here. Once CSI creates the storage and mounts it into an application pod, uh, that application connects directly to a kernel driver, which then is connected to a Ceph cluster. I know that was quite a lot. I'll sort of slowly kind of ramp up to talking about some of the key features. Uh, that I want to highlight in Rook and Ceph. Uh, these are features that are noteworthy, noteworthy and that are most commonly useful to, to people. I'll start with installation, uh, which we've tried to make as simple as possible. Um, really, there are kind of four steps to setting up a Ceph cluster, and the first three it could as easily be done on one line as they could on three different lines. Uh, very rarely do these need any modification at all. And then creation of the Ceph cluster resource uh, that we have in Rook is uh, the only thing that most people really need to, to customize to get things started. And at its simplest, it could be the 13 lines of code that you see, uh, the 13 lines of YAML that you see off to the right. We also really would have precious little without our Ceph CSI driver. Uh, this is the thing that makes all of our hard work available to, to the user when they uh, want block or file storage. Uh, the key features of Ceph, Ceph CSI that we have uh, are volume expansion. If you make a volume of five gigabytes and you need 20 gigabytes later, that's possible. We also have snapshots and clones. Uh, those are still in beta, uh, but those are rapidly becoming more and more stable. Um, also, for a note, we are very soon deprecating the old, old, old flex volume driver. Uh, and as part of this deprecation, we're working on a tool to migrate those flex volumes uh, or persistent volumes created with the flex volume driver to CSI or alternately for migrating in-tree drivers to CSI uh, so that users don't have to migrate things manually. Rook also runs in really any environment you could want. Uh, these commonly we break down into two, two basic umbrellas being bare metal or inside of a cloud provider. With bare metal, this may be you have your own hardware, or it may be that you have a shared hardware situation in a data center. We commonly get asked, especially by people used to running Kubernetes on bare metal, why would you want to run Rook in a cloud provider? And the, the responses here I, I really find quite fascinating. Uh, cloud providers, do actually have several shortcomings for a lot of users. Uh, storage 
like storage types are not always available across availability zones. Uh, one availability zone may have object storage where another does not, for example. Some, uh, some cloud provider storage also takes a long time to fail over. Uh, Rook can very often fail over in seconds versus minutes. Uh, some cloud providers also limit the number of PVs you can have per node to 30, uh, which is sort of pathetically small for, for a lot of users. And it may simply be that users want to save money. They can use a cloud provider, they can still use cloud provider storage, but they can use something that has a better cost to performance ratio and to aggregate that together into something that's usable with Rook. Uh, the bottom line also, especially for multi-cloud situations, is that consistent a consistent storage platform uh, like the one that Rook can provide is can be used anywhere Kubernetes is deployed. Uh, and this is like, again, the interface is just using persistent volume claims for underlying storage. There's no nothing extra or fancy. It's just make a claim for storage. And in a cloud environment, there's no need for direct access to local devices as we're using a cloud provider's PVCs as the underlying storage in many cases. Also, sort of expanding on environments here, we uh, it's possible to configure Rook for any cluster topology, really. Um, this is customizable across failure domains uh, or within failure domains. And this really is uh, toward the end of providing a highly available and durable storage. Uh, and this is achieved by spreading Ceph daemons and data across failure domains uh, as much as possible. Also, a lot of users want to keep their application pods separate from their storage pods and have a subset of nodes for storage and a subset of nodes for applications, and that's possible uh, pretty easily using node affinities and taints and tolerations. Also key with Rook is that updates are automated. I mentioned this a little bit before. Uh, and we can think of this in like in two parts. There are upgrades to Ceph, and then there are upgrades to Rook. Uh, with Ceph updates and even major upgrades are fully and totally automated. Rook handles everything. I can go from a major release of Ceph, Ceph version 15 Octopus, for example, to version 16 Pacific and Rook just does it. Uh, patch updates to Rook going from you know, version 1.7.4 to 1.7.5 or 6 or 7 uh, is also fully automated within Rook. Uh, but if we're talking about Rook minor upgrades, upgrading from Rook version 1.6 to Rook version 1.7 does sometimes require manual work. Uh, and this is just because uh, sometimes we need to update the permissions that Rook has or uh, any number of things, or we have feature deprecations which require a, a small amount of manual work if users are using those features. Uh, a notable feature deprecation I just talked about is deprecating the flex volume, which is very little used anymore even. Uh, feel free to read the latest uh, Ceph upgrade guide here at the link also. Another cool thing that we've had in Rook for a while is the ability to connect up to an external Ceph cluster. Um, Ceph has been around for a long time. I mentioned, or in the previous slide mentioned that it had been around since 2012. And many users may already have a Ceph cluster up and running, and they simply want to use it within Kubernetes. Well, Rook also allows connecting to that external Ceph cluster so that then Kubernetes has access to it. And just like if Rook itself were running the Ceph cluster, uh, users can still just request the storage they want, and it gets created in Kubernetes. And there's no, no fiddling necessary, no extra administration ex necessary. We also have been really interested in some of the upstream work to provision object storage buckets. 
And uh, currently, uh, what this looks like is users or administrators can create a storage class for Ceph object storage, and then users can create uh, an object bucket claim. Uh, and this is very similar to a, a persistent volume claim. It's just for a bucket rather than a volume. And then whenever Rook sees that uh, OBC come in, it creates a bucket, and then it gives the user access to the bucket via a Kubernetes secret. There's also a Kubernetes enhancement proposal called COSI, the Container Object Storage Interface, which we're, uh, we've been following pretty closely, and we're uh, waiting to get into Kubernetes so, so we can also provide this option for users. And uh, this aims to be CSI, but for object storage, if I were to put it in a very short number of words. Finally, we have the features with the recent Rook version 1.7 release. This was from August of 2021. Uh, the, the three notable updates I can provide here are that stretch cluster now is stable. Uh, I will, I'll talk about stretch cluster in more detail in a minute. Uh, we also protect user data whenever we're deleting a Ceph cluster. So we don't allow a Ceph cluster to actually be deleted if any other Rook resources exist. And this is to prevent uh, an administrator from accidentally deleting user data uh, that may exist, that maybe they just missed, or a user missed the deadline for backing up their data, or whatever it is. We also have continued uh, to add support for mirroring file systems from one Ceph cluster to another. Uh, we now have full support for this, at least as far as the Ceph project is concerned. Uh, we do have a note that this is still a newer feature in Ceph, and it is still considered under testing. So I promised I would get back to stretch cluster. Uh, many users want to run Ceph in multiple failure domains. This allows us to actually have the better disaster protection that I mentioned. And most commonly, this is really either two zones or three zones. We, we really don't see more than three zones terribly often. The problem with clusters in two zones is how do we maintain a quorum if a zone fails? Because by definition, quorum has to be more than 50% of uh, the, the daemons in quorum for Ceph, that is the Ceph monitors. Well, the solution that the Ceph project has come up with is to have a third zone acting as a minimal tiebreaker. And I, I would encourage you, if you're interested in these scenarios, to look at the Ceph documentation about this. But I will also briefly talk about what this looks like visually. Uh, we have two primary zones, and this is in our example where all of our user applications live. This is also where all of our Ceph storage lives. And this is where most of the Ceph monitors are going to live. We have the third zone on the right, which is a monitor that exists as a tiebreaker just for the case of a whole zone going down. We still can have a majority quorum. And this is still what it looks like during normal operation. But what this situation really cares about is failure. So imagine that one of your primary zones goes offline. Maybe you live in Houston, Texas, and there's a hurricane. And now your data center is under three feet of water. True story. This actually happened to me. With this tiebreaker zone, there are still a majority quorum of three out of five nodes. Uh, and Ceph has protected all of your data. All of these OSDs in zone two still have all of the data that exists, and it's still available. Kubernetes, because it's Kubernetes, will reschedule any applications from zone one into zone two once it realizes they're failed. And now after some surprisingly short amount of downtime, ideally less than 15 minutes. Uh, all of your applications are still running. And most people in the outside world are not aware. They don't have to know that your data center in Houston just got flooded. 
Okay, I think I've talked long enough for now. I'm gonna pass to my colleague Satoru, uh, who's gonna give you a demo of what it is like to install Rook. I have a demo to create a simple Rook safe cluster. Uh, I will use these two softwares. There are two types of Rook safe clusters. The first one is host-based cluster. And the second one is PBC based cluster. Host based cluster is suitable for a simple cluster, especially if uh, you use uh, all nodes and all devices for a look safe cluster. But safe cluster cluster resource get complicated if not all nodes and devices are used. At worst, you should uh, list all nodes and all devices for uh, clusters, used for clusters. As for PVC-based cluster, you are free from describing hardware configurations like this. And then you should, uh, you should specify only two fields, the count field and the volume claim template field. Count field means the uh, number of OSTs and the uh, volume claim template field is used for a template of PVC and used for OSTs. PVC based cluster is very easy to expand. You just need to increase the count field. If you increase this field from one to two, the number of OSD is also increased to two. So let's create a, a simple PVC based cluster. I use uh, uh, one Kubernetes cluster uh, consists of uh, one node. This node has uh, two local empty block devices and the corresponding persistent volume. This demo uh, consists of three steps, and you can get the all script and the all manifest from uh, this project. So let's create a rook safe uh, rook operator as a step one. So kube control apply hardware and uh, operator.yaml. So the operator is created. O operator is created and the uh, uh, rook safe cluster, uh, rook safe namespace, get port k the rook safe operator cross uh, operator port is already already running. So the second step is create a uh, rook safe cluster. The manifest is on in the cluster on pbc.yaml. Yes, it's a safe cluster, cluster uh, custom resource, and it means the number of monitor port is one, and the number of OST is also one. So let's apply this manifest. Mm, right. Uh, there. No, 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 no. Cluster. Okay. So let's see the progress of creating this, <clears throat> creating root safe cluster. Get port. So root safe operator is already exist, and the G's port, uh, uh, G's port uh, for um, safe CSI drivers. And now safe monitor port is running. And the second and the next step is create a manager port. And the third step is rooks, uh, creating root safe operate uh, rooks OSD rook safe OSD prepare port. It's to initialize the <clears throat> initialize the uh, data structure on top of uh, local block device. And the last uh, rook safe OSD port is created. 
it's to manage OST ports. So, save get PVC. Okay. So this uh this um past and volume claim is created by Rook, and it's bound to local OST to <clears throat> to past and volume. Uh, it's the it's corresponding to <clears throat> uh one of the on uh, local OST. Um, this PVC is consumed by this OST port. So let's confirm the status of um, safe cluster through safe tools. Mm -hmm. Apply, ah, uh, no, 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 toolbox port. Okay. On the road, safe. Exec self tools. So self hyphen s command is to uh, to see the status of uh self cluster. Okay, the self cluster is actually created, and the the number of monitor is one. The number of manager is one, and uh, there, are, there is uh, one with this, okay. So the third and the last step is expand this cluster. So it's very easy, as uh, said uh, before. So it's by editing um, self cluster cluster resource. Okay, count one. Okay, so it means the number of OSD. So let's increase this to two. And let's confirm who self get port. Okay, so the next, the second um, look safe prepare port will be created soon. So wait for a while. Okay, the OST prepare port is created and it's running uh, the now creating the second OST data structure. And the now OST port is created and running. Okay, so let's confirm the, let's run the <coughs> safe hyphen S again. Okay, the number of OST, uh, <clears throat> number of OST is now two. Okay, the, it means uh, this cluster is expanded correctly. There are advanced configurations about um, PVC based cluster. The first one is create patch and volumes for OSTs on demand. In this demo, I prepared the two, um, two patch and volumes beforehand. But uh, if you use CSI drivers with dynamic volume provisioning, you can omit this step, uh, this work. And the second, Second configuration is even OSD spreading among all nodes. To use uh, this feature, uh, you can use topology, topology spread constraint feature in Kubernetes. Uh, if you are interested in um, these configurations, please refer to this blog post. Thank you, Satoru, for the demo. Uh, Thank you all for, for watching and for your interest in Rook. Uh, I'm gonna leave this last slide here with some links to our website and documentation and anything else that you, you might have interest in about the Rook project. And I'm gonna attempt to leave these open while we then uh, go to the Q&A portion of our, uh, of our presentation.